Father. And so we realize that our Heavenly Father is the example as we're to be as an earthly father. And I would be the first one to say that I've fallen short mightily. Anybody else? Amen. We've all fallen short of the glory of God in His righteousness. So uh, when it comes to the term our Father, uh, like I said, I might as well address this right off because I truly believe this is why many people struggle in their relationship with God is because they struggled with their relationship with their earthly father. Amen? They, they struggle with that. You look across media today, and, and what do we see for fathers? Uh, uh, throughout, even backing up, even into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, you know, and I'm not going to be able to quote a lot from every generation because I don't watch a lot. Uh, but, you know, uh, when I think back into the archives and clear out the cobwebs in my mind, you know, when, when you think of father, uh, you know, and we had in the, in the 70s, we had Archie Bunker. What a great father figure. I mean, come on. You know, you, you get into the 80s and you have, uh, um, I can't even think of his first name, but Mr. Bundy. Al Bundy. You know, yeah, we laugh, but what a great example of a father. Uh, you know, Homer Simpson. What a great example that, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And, and what does this begin to show us that uh, this is not an example. It, it just shows uh, bumbling idiots. Amen? It doesn't show the example of a father of what we need to have as a father. No, I realize that in the marriage and in the home and in the family, both roles are very important, but they're also very different. One does not diminish from the other. They build upon each other. And so we have got to understand that God wants us to have a clear recognition of Him as our Heavenly Father. And it is to be one that we reverence, that we show as authority. Not, you know, not that if we step out of line one you know, minute, well, you better call me sir, and you better do this, and you better dot every I and cross every T, otherwise, boom, you're out of here. That's not our God. Now, approaching God with reverence and respect means you approach with Him in a humility in your heart that you realize you need Him. Amen? It doesn't mean that God is up there, you know, with a manual saying, okay, you've done this, you missed that, you missed that. That's not our God. He is not a legalistic God. He wants us to love Him and to respect Him and to honor Him. And you know how you do that? You do it by doing what He wants us to do. That's how you do it. That's how you love and honor God. That's how you honor your earthly father and your earthly mother. You do things that would please them. And that might be different for each and every one. Amen? And so the idea or the thought of a father is skewed in our world today. Um, it, it, I, think it's, I think it's sad that if an individual goes today to buy a fishing license or a hunting license, and if you don't hunt or fish, you may not realize this, uh, but uh, there are things in there that will prevent them because there's something known today as child support. And there are people that, uh, because of divorces in families or people that were never married, uh, that people aren't paying child support. And so you can't get a hunting license or a fishing license. It, it just, it, it hurts me deep to know that there are individuals out there that would rather go and spend money on that than try to support their family. And so that's a target area. That's, that's a red flag, if you will, in our world today. Uh, why? Because the home is broken. Our culture is broken. God in His Word, and, and, and don't take this as somebody out here just waving a Bible or trying to cram this down somebody's throat, but God in His Word has given us a structure for family. And it's intended, one man and one woman, joined together in holy matrimony, not living in sin, and then raising a family together and living in godly fear and reverence, raising their children to love God and to fear God and to know His Word and to have respect for authority and, and to learn how to grow and be nurtured. Our world does not have that because they don't have an understanding of who their father is. Can you say Amen. In Jewish culture, your father played a very important role in your life. And you did respect your father because not, uh, not only, I'm sure, that there was disciplinary actions. You know, the Bible even says in, in the Old Testament under the law, and of course we're not under the ceremonial uh, Old Testament anymore. We're still under the moral. 
part of it. We still honor our fathers and mothers, uh, but we're not under the eye for the eye and the tooth for the tooth anymore, okay? Um, but in the Old Testament, if there was a child that was rebellious and would not take correction, would not receive instruction and just continually, continually, continually went astray and brought dishonor and caused problems, do you know what they were to do with that child? They were to take him outside the camp and stone them to death. What kind of God would do that? The kind of God that cares about his people and doesn't want that one bad apple to ruin the whole bunch. That's what kind of God does that. That's a God of mercy and grace. And people are allowed to make their own choices. But you know, the awesome thing is, and I've read the Bible through. I don't have it memorized. There's times I still read it. and You know, I've read it through multiple times, but I still read it and, and, and see scriptures in there that, wow, I don't remember ever reading that before. Anybody else? Or I never saw it that way before. Sure we do, because there's a lot in there. And so I don't ever remember reading a story where a child was taken out in stone because of that rebellious. So the law brought an understanding and a respect in the household. And so uh, now I do read in the New Testament that we might cover a little bit later uh, of a story of a son who went astray, but that father was there welcoming him back. Amen? And so the idea of a father in the Jewish life, they understood that their father was the source of many things for them. And it was very important. In fact, three very important things uh, that determined your future came from your father in Jewish culture. The first thing was your birthright. Everybody say birthright. Now this was very important to the firstborn son was the birthright. It was something he wanted passed on to him. The birthright gave that child a double portion of everything the father had. Who would want a double portion of God's? What God has. Amen? Amen. Now, Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion. Nothing wrong with asking for a double portion. That just means we're hungry for the things of God. And so the, the firstborn son received a double portion of the father's possessions of what he owned. And it also gave the child authority. Everybody say authority. In the household over their father's things and for the father's name. Genesis uh, 25 and 30 tells us a story about two brothers, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the elder, and Jacob was the younger. They were the sons uh, of Isaac. And Esau was a hunter of the field. I mean, he was the man's man. Jacob, the Bible says, he, was, he dwelt in tents, and he was a plain man. It uh, doesn't say a lot about Jacob, of his characteristics, but we know that Esau was uh, the kind of big and burly and hairy, you know, the kind probably really gruff. And Jacob was probably uh, just used his mind more and was a little bit more soft-spoken. But Esau was out in the field one day, and he was hunting all day. He had walked probably miles and miles. He had tracked animals. He had done everything he knew to do as a skillful hunter. But that day, everything just eluded him. He could not find uh, a track to follow. He could not find a deer to kill. He couldn't get anything, and he was hungry. He had walked. He had expired his energy, his resources inside. He was, he was hungry. Anybody ever been hungry? He was faint. He was shaky. Blood sugar a little bit low. He wanted some food. Amen? And so he starts walking back home, and he's probably thinking, oh, man, uh, man there's got to be some there's got to be some dried beef or some stale bread or something. I mean, I'll, I'll eat anything at this point. And he comes uh, probably getting closer within, uh, you know, uh, probably within, a, you know, maybe multiple yards of their house or their, their tents. And all of a sudden he begins to smell something. Oh, man, that smells so good. Oh, he smells the herbs and the seasoning in it. And, oh, that smells like a really good stew. And he, and he gets closer, and, and he gets a little bit closer, and he's hungry. And, and finally, he comes around the corner, and there he sees his brother Jacob stirring the pot. Ooh, that needs a little bit more oregano. Oh, yeah, just, mmm, oh, this is so good. And, and sees uh, Esau coming and just, mmm, man, this is good good stew. And, and Esau says, hey, <laughs> get me up a bowl of that stuff right now, man. I'm, I'm, in fact, just slide me over the whole pot. I'm hungry. Man, Jacob, you are such a good cook. And what a great brother. You're my favorite brother, uh, Jacob. You know, and, and I'm really hungry. I'm at the point to die. I need food. 
And Jacob says, oh, I can help you out. I can, I can get you some food, but it's going to cost you. I want your birthright. See, Esau was hungry for fleshly things. Jacob, as wrong as it was, but he was, his, mo- his motives were right, but his method was wrong. But he was hungry for spiritual things. And so he said, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, I'm at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? You know what he said right there? He said, what does my dad have that I need? I need to fill my belly more than I need any blessing from my father. I need to take care of my need right now more than I need anything from God. God, I'm willing to disobey God's word right now just to gratify my flesh. Amen? That's what he was saying. And so Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, bean soup, And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. And thus it says, Esau despised his birthright. Church, what we get from our Heavenly Father is our birthright. And it's something that we can't ever trade anything in this world for. There is nothing worth getting distracted for. No temptation, no sin, no struggle, no relationship. Anything that's worth severing me and my relationship with my God. Esau felt that his desire to feed his flesh was of more value than anything his father had to offer for his future. And how many times do we find that in the world today? How many times do we see that all around? Oh, this is more important than my relationship with my father. This, this relationship is more important. This need is more important. This want, this desire, this lust of my flesh, of my eyes, this pride of my life is more important than anything God has to offer me. The other thing that came along with the double portion authority was a responsibility. You see, the oldest son then became the heir of the household, so when the father would pass away, he was to provide for the mother if she was a widow and for any unmarried sisters. Remember, church, the firstborn male also was to be redeemed. What that means is the Bible says in the law that God said any animal, the firstborn that opens a matrix, the firstborn of your lambs, the firstborn of your oxen, and the firstborn even of unclean animals, It had to be given to God. Now, unclean animals, God did not want as a sacrifice, so you could redeem the unclean animal with a clean animal, like a sheep or an oxen, and you could keep the the mule if you wanted to keep it and, and offer a lamb in its place. Otherwise, you had to break its neck and kill it because it belonged to God. And the firstborn of your children... The firstborn male belonged to God. Now, God was not interested in human sacrifice. Aren't you thankful for that? But he was interested in us understanding his principles. And so what he did was he said, you're firstborn of your children, you shall redeem. That's why when Jesus was born, when he was eight days old, his mother and father took him to the temple and they brought two turtle doves. Because Jesus had to be redeemed. And so the firstborn son was redeemed. So spiritually... We are all God's children, and I feel that everyone who is born again falls into the responsibility of the elder son because God just has children. Amen? Each and every one of us. He died and gave his life for every one of us that we could be born again as his children. And so as his children, our spiritual birthright should be of great value to us. Do you believe that today? I said our spiritual birthright should be of great value to us. There shouldn't be anything that I want to trade my birthright for, my my opportunity that I have with my God. That should be valuable to me. More than any other desire of my flesh or any other thing of this world, I should never want to get rid of the relationship I have with God to trade it for something else. In fact, even spiritually, church, we receive more than a double portion of God's blessing. God is so good to us. 
And if we get a double portion of what God has, what does God have?